This is the dance break section of the song. So this is a good time for us to come back. And uh, as we are all doing our Charleston fingers, yes, our jazz hands here in the studio, (laughs) enjoying just the joyousness of that music. And I mean, you know, when you talk about kind of mission critical stamp on your black card stuff that you just have to know. Okay. You at least have to have seen school days one time and remember this particular scene because we're not encouraging anybody to call one another jigaboos and wannabes, but in context of the film, it was a necessary exposition and it adds to, you know, this idea of how we use film and television to help create sort of the cultural criteria by which we're measuring our lives. And our special guest today, uh, I know he's listening, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just going to warn him. I'm going to tamp down my, my, my crush enthusiasm. We've we've gotten into something here. I didn't quite realize (laughs) to the full extent until good and bad hair came on as the opening. Cause usually it's going to be some uh, earth, wind and fire or some, but you know, I also try and find uh, soundtrack. Or something. But I also try and find soundtrack songs you during went, you our went segment. You went extra for this one. Because I love it. Uh, you know, I love okay. it so much. And I love this man's body of work. So I will allow okay. you to do the official. Right. But first of all, hi, Mike D. Hey, hey, Stephanie Renee. <laughs> and hey, everybody watching on Facebook Live. Um, yeah, so um, I'm super excited. I've been, I've been wanting to have this gentleman on the show represented in some way for some for quite some time, yeah. Um, you know, knew him back in the day, and now reconnected through social media. And and uh, this is a great week, to or a great time to have it on. Just like there, like they say, there are no coincidences. Like everybody recently was talking about Get Out, yes. and how that was such a, a a landmark that it was a horror film with uh, consciousness and and blackness and all that stuff. But but I mean, it's it's sort of like I was I'm scratching my head. I'm like, well, wait, didn't people, didn't people remember about Tales, Tales from the Hood, yes. 1994? And with us on the line, uh, the co-creator and director, writer, star, actor of that, along with a ton of a other ton stuff. of other stuff for the hour. <laughs> and we want people to listen and call in and share their memories. Um, show this brother some love, Rusty Cundia. Woo! Line, Hi, everybody. Rusty, and welcome to WURD. Well, uh, thank you. Good morning. That was one of the nicest, uh, rather longest introductions. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate it. Very kind. Well, we, you know, we love you, Rusty. So, um, so uh, the first thing, Tales from the Hood, out now on Blu-ray. Ah, yes. Right. right. Um, it uh, just came out. You know, so looking back, um, you know, and, and in light of Get Out, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you saw that. I mean, what, how do you, how do you feel like being part of this? It's a very select, uh, subgenre black horror films that actually are about blackness yeah um you know it's really exciting to see what get out has has accomplished and and the attention that it's thrown on uh a genre that normally normally isn't known for dealing with issues and so it, it, but, but it's a perfect genre to deal with issues because and, and that's what we felt when we were doing Tales from the Hood, is that when, you, when you're when you dealing with the horror genre, you're always dealing with some version of evil or some type of monster or some type of oddness in the universe. Yes. Mm-hmm. And all of those things, all of those words can be related to race relations, social problems, uh, you know, sexual politics mm-hmm. between uh, between men and women. So it really is a great genre for dealing with that. And, and seeing, uh, I guess, Get Out come along and kind of take up in, in a, a broader way in the social consciousness, you know, what we were doing with Tales from the Hood is, is just really a positive thing. Indeed it is. And, you know, I mean, one of the things that I love, you know, we, we, I jokingly refer to this whole idea of a black card, what you have to have seen, what, you know, is a part of your cultural lexicon when you're, you know, just dealing with other people and and the, you know, uh, sub story that you have as a part of Tales from the Hood with these characters coming down from the picture is something that for people who have seen it, I mean, we love all of the different stories that you included as a part of that. But that's just one of the ones that sticks with folks 
folks in particular because of the idea of how we really do uh, deal with these symbols that we have surrounding us all the time and the idea of how you get free. And so I just think there's a, a, a revised love for the way that you approach storytelling in that film. And I'm so glad to know it's on Blu-ray because I'm going to get it and make, you'll get that high definition visual. Yeah, you, you you want to get the high definition visual of those little dolls coming out of the picture. <laughs> <laughs> that was, you know, one one of the things that I got a kick out of, uh, one of the few things I got a kick out of this past election, because <laughs> we know how it ended up. <laughs> but um, there was a, a meme going around on on social media where someone had taken a shot of the picture with the dolls and. Uh, my mom actually was a voodoo woman in the rocking chair. So nice. So took a picture of that, and they had, oh, this is what uh, the Obamas should leave in the, in the White House. <laughs> <laughs> hold him accountable, right. Yeah, hold him accountable. <laughs> um, but, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's one of my favorite uh, stories with entails from the hood. It's, it's a really... It's, it's a fun one, I guess you could say. Yeah. I, I mean, and it draws back, you know, there's so much kind of uh, cult fandom for um, uh, um, um, what? Uh, Twilight Zone. Okay. Uh, you know, you, mm-hmm. you, me trying to grasp for words here. But, you know, Twilight Zone and some of those other uh, kind of period uh, 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 features that people used to stay up late night and watch and, you know, have just become a part of it. And I think Tales, Tales from the Hood and that story in particular really draws us into that style of, of storytelling and, and the way that people can be scared and laugh at the same time and really think about, as you said, this role that horror or, or, you know, even if it's softcore horror can play in making us think about social issues. Yeah. It, well, obviously, uh, Twilight Zone was a big influence on uh, the approach to Tales from the Hood, with no doubt. Uh, there's, I think Rod Serling was, I, I, as far as I know, one of the one of the real originators of that art form. There, there were other movies that did uh, anthologies, um, but he really nailed a lot of social issues in the Twilight Zone, uh, including race and, mm-hmm. and so many other things. So that was a big jumping off point for us uh, as we, we looked at it. And, and, the, and the whole vibe, which obviously, which you've seen it, of Tales from the Hood is that the, the evil, the horror, what you're afraid of in Tales from the Hood are... The humans, you're not really afraid of the supernatural. The supernatural <laughs> is a redemptive element throughout the, throughout the film. Yeah. I mean, you know, people get scared of the dolls and this, that, and the other. But ultimately, if you're not a bad person, the dolls aren't going to bother you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you <know? laughs> um, the zombie isn't going to come after you. The, the thing that happens to David Allen Greer and the yeah. with Follow J. Parker. So these are all, you know, as I tell my kids, and I'm sure other parents do, but, you know, when your kid goes to bed and is like, oh, I'm afraid there's a ghost, there's a this. I'm like, ghosts and dead people don't bother you. <laughs> Living people bother you. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you have to be careful about. And that really is what we were dealing with in the movie. It's, it's man's evil ways. Mm-hmm. And similarly, it's what you see in, you know, the film Get Out. It's the people that are really scary in that movie. Mm-hmm. Right. So we're talking with Rusty Kondiev and his uh, latest, his film, his classic, his cult classic, Tales from the Hood, is out now on Blu-ray, which is exciting because it, it was one of the hardest DVDs to get ever. Like if you wanted a copy, it was out of print for a long time and copies yeah. are going for 50 60 $70, mm-hmm. believe it or not. People did not want to let go of this. So now it's like pristine commentary, special edition, all this stuff. But one of the questions I have is like, how how did this come about? I know it's part of a an era, like I know Spike Likely also did Drop Scrot around the same time, executive mm-hmm. produced. But I mean, how how did the idea come about? How did how did you even get money for this and and get to star, write, and direct? Well, uh, you know how they say, what is it? Preparation uh, meets luck. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, I had started out as an actor. I'd been in school days, mm-hmm. and we're going to talk I, about I that too. Five G's in school days, so I met <laughs> Spike there. So that relationship was kind of, was, was there, though I, as we started working on Tales from the Hood, I, I, Spike wasn't the first thing that came into my mind. So uh, I had done a play, a play called The Black Horror Show, 
uh, or lycanthropy, or blackanthropy, I call it. But lycanthropy, uh, if you're a real old school horror fan, is the disease of being a werewolf. It's called lycanthropy. Yes. So this was blackanthropy, which of course would be called the disease of being black. Now the, the twist on that was, uh, I had a character who was a very uh, wealthy corporate black businessman who really didn't care about black folks. And he went to uh, a Black History Month uh, parade and got touched by someone else who had this this disease. And what happened was... Whoops. Uh-oh. Okay, well, got to got to try and back. That was yeah. a great story. As, as, yes, as you can tell. As, but um, well, let's let's fill people in while we're while we're waiting for the reconnection. Um, you know, so I mean, people, if you have questions for Rusty, you can call in at yes two one five six three four eight zero six five toll free at one eight six six three six one zero nine hundred. Shout out to the people who are checking us out on our Facebook live feed, and we'll I'll bring the camera down, I promise, so that you right. can actually be more centered on <laughs> right. Mike and I. They, as they a just part they, of this they just don't want you to know this, but I mean, well, <laughs> also I should by way of introduction, Rusty is also responsible for Fear of a Black Hat. Yes, and which. which was We'll talk person. about it a little bit. Um, you know, as as he was mentioning, he acted in School Days. School Days. As, we'll talk about well, that in a minute. As well as Hollywood Shuffle, and then your favorite we talked about last week, Sprung. Yes, I'm a, a cult fan of uh, of Sprung as well. But it and looks dir- like we have Rusty and back directed, online. Directed directed some of our favorite sketches from the Chappelle Show. Yes. So uh, uh, Rusty's back in line. So as back. as you were saying, they just don't want to know the truth. It's getting too woke <laughs> up on on Real Black TV today. Yes. So Real Black, Black Anthropy. Oh, the black hat. Oh, okay, so I had this thing called the Black Horror Show, and I kind of explained what that was. And that was a short play that I had that we were doing out here at the Los Angeles Theater Center. And so at one point, uh, a friend of mine, Darren Scott, who was the producer and my co-writers on Tale from, from the Hood, mm-hmm. he had done kind of your regular sort of horror film. And he said, I want to do another horror film. I said, we got to make it socially conscious. Come see my play. And that was the jumping off point for us to start taking this path where we wanted to do this socially conscious thing. And then I uh, kind of got lucky because I was at a film premiere of Spikes. So I can't remember which Spike, which film it was of Spikes. Uh, but I show up at the premiere and Spike is there. And afterwards, I come out and I said, hey, Spike, it's good to see you. He's like, what are you doing? I said, I'm working on a film film because he had seen fear of a black hat, so he knew that I was directing things. He said, I want to do it. Wow. (laughs) Nice. So we sent him the script, and he became a wonderful producer champion. And and by wonderful, I mean he was a producer that when the studio pushed back on some of the ideas we have, as studios Mm -hmm. normally do, Mm -hmm. I came to our, you know, he said, leave them alone. They do what they want to do. So we actually kind of by default, got Spike's, uh, we got what Spike would have gotten, which was a lot of deference from the studio in terms <laughs> of how much they tried to get in our way. Yeah. And that's what really allowed us, I think, to make the movie that we wanted to make. So uh, Spike was very instrumental in uh, helping us along that path. No, I'm just curious, I mean, was this done for a lot of money, or was this like just sort of... Um, not, not a lot of money, but more money than most uh, young filmmakers get now for a first film. This, it was, but I, I, I'm, I can't remember what Get Out is now, but the art budget was about $6 million. Okay. Mm-hmm. But at the time, you had to understand that all of the effects, for the most part, that you see in the movie are what are called practical effects. They're not CGI. They're not created in a computer. They're things that we had to build and actually shoot. So... The doll that you see, the dolls that you see running around, that's all stop motion. They have yeah. to wow. these dolls and slowly move them bit by bit, you know, kind of like the Rudolph the Reindeer mm-hmm. uh, Christmas <laughs> the Christmas special. So that stuff takes a lot of time and effort. I'm actually kind of glad that we did it that way as opposed to the way we'd have done it today with CGI because I think the stop animation of those dolls moving looks a lot scarier than kind of the smooth motion you get from uh, CGI now. Yeah. Uh, 
Indeed. Well, you know, I mean, the the whole idea of how you entrench yourself in an industry and expand your influence from being the writer actor to the writer director to the writer producer is, you know, another piece of the story that that we really need to get some insight from you about, because there are a lot of, you know, we talk very often here on the segment about the democratization of the technology. Right. So everybody can now go out and buy a camera or use their uh, uh, you know, highly equipped smartphones in order to shoot footage and to contribute to the process. But what it takes to be committed to great storytelling in the midst of all of that is something that a lot of people, uh, especially young folks, are, are trying to wrap their brains around because they see that now there's so many more opportunities for people within the cable networks and what have you to expand their influence. But being able to tell a good story is not a skill that a lot of people are equipped with. And you, you know, came with a, a, a set of skills and a body of knowledge that, you know, is a big commodity these days. Well, it's funny because I was having this conversation with my son last night and I was telling him that, you know, he said, what's the most important thing in making a movie? Is it the actors? Is it the director? Is it the story? I said, it's always the story. If you don't have a good story, it doesn't matter who's directing, and it doesn't matter what stars you have. I mean, that, that might get a few people into the theater or in front of the TV set, but if the story isn't there, you don't have anything. And so um, we are at an interesting point technologically where anyone can go out and make their version of a movie or a television show or a web series. What this generally distinguishes what's good from bad is the story that is is being told. And the other interesting thing is, when you, when you talk about the importance of story, is that, and I'm, I'm sure you've seen this, like, perhaps if, even if you've seen uh, like one of my movies, uh, Fear of a Black Hat, mm -hmm. not the, it's not the most elegant filming. You get mm -hmm. gripped by the story. Yeah. And I'm sure you've also gone to movies that are big films, that have big stars and awesome directors and, and things flying all about, and you walk out and you feel empty. Yeah. Because ultimately, the story matters more than the production value of the film. Mm -hmm. You can have a crappy-looking film with a great story and enjoy it far more than a brilliantly, uh, you know, sci-fi special affected thing. <laughs> that doesn't have a good story. So yeah. Stories are, you know, which is why books work. There's no, there's no visuals. <laughs> yes. It's just what works in, in telling a story. And I think for black folk or brown folk or women folk, <laughs> people whose stories need to be, uh, not just stories, but their, their attitudes, their, their dreams, their hopes, their problems, to get all of that across, you want to have a great story, and I, I think that's what you're seeing with some of the, you know, all these shows now that are coming on that have black protagonists, black female protagonists. Mm -hmm. um, you're starting to see the, the, these stories come out in a broader way. It's not that they haven't always been there, but, you know, someone has realized that there's money to be made serving this audience yes. that has a hunger for are and uh, and not only that that the white audience is also interested in right. those stories yes so that's that's a very interesting thing Right. Well, yeah, definitely a true pioneer. I mean, uh, we, we have you for the hour, right? So uh, we just have to make some money ourselves. <laughs> um, but when, when we come back, uh, I want to talk about breaking and entering, you know, like basically making a role for yourself in yes. the entertainment industry and then carrying it on. Now we're talking 20 plus. I don't even want to. I, what I was going to say, it, but it's, it's, all, it's the sense of time. So we will be continuing, ladies and gentlemen, on Facebook Live, on the air, streaming, who are checking us out today we'll be continuing with this week's edition of real black radio with our special hour-long guest rusty kundiaf as we continue after this enterprise exterminators provides customers with the highest quality service enterprise will evaluate and eliminate whatever pest problems you may have specializing in bed bugs fleas mice and 
termites. Hurry down to 4943 Wayne Avenue or call 215-849-7070. Enterprise services Pennsylvania, Delaware, and New Jersey and is licensed and insured. Free inspection and do-it-yourself kits are available. Call now and ask about their word discount. 215-849-7070. Teachers in the school district of Philadelphia make a major impact every day. But don't just take our word for it. I teach sixth grade math and science. I teach Spanish to high school students. I teach CTE program. I'm a second grade teacher. The school district of Philadelphia is hiring right now for the 2017-2018 school year. I love going to work every day. I had so much support. It's an amazing experience and I wouldn't work anywhere else. It's a wonderful place. All the teachers in the school are a team. We really are a team. They make you feel like a community, like a sense of family, and that's the place I wanted to be in. If you really want to have an impact in education, then there's no better opportunity than to work in the Philly School District. It's not only life-changing for you, but for your students. If you want to make an impact in a student's life, then join us and become a teacher for the School District of Philadelphia. Apply online today at jobs.philasd.org. That's jobs.philasd.org. Make an impact today. It's the free Pyramid STEM Showcase. Explore and learn science and technology on Saturday, April 29th from 11 a.m. till 4 p.m. at the Progress Plaza Shopping Center at 1501 North Broad Street. For information, 215-844-4200 or pyramidstem.com. Join Tim O'Gara of TSO Adjustment Service on his new show on WRD Radio Sunday, April 30th from 5 to 6 p.m. Grab your homeowner's policy. Tim will navigate you through what it really says. Tune in this Sunday, April 30th, 5 to 6 p.m. We often talk about the buying power in the African-American community, and tech is usually at the forefront of products that we spend billions on each year. In fact, a recent Nielsen report has stated that black millennials are leading the way in their use of technology to impact change and get their voices heard. But how can we ensure that the African-American community also benefits economically from the advancement of technology? Join Word Radio in partnership with Philly Tech Week and Wilco Electronics for From Consumer to Creator, how black communities can transform tech technology consumption into economic power wednesday may 3rd from 12 noon till 2 p.m in the skyline room of the central library 1901 vine street this interactive discussion will examine how the black community can transform its overconsumption of technology into wealth creation entrepreneurship and economic empowerment rsvp now for this free event at 900 am wurd.com or call 215-425-7875 sponsored by fulton bank You are listening to The Mojo on 900 AM WURD. Embrace and explore your black magic. I dream of your nights, daytime too, like someone must let me something. Not something you almost walked into a wall Imagining your embrace Had to smell myself out of the thought of lips Shall I have any taste? And the sensation is real The blood rushes into Which place is if you were here? I love it in me too Cold isolation I feel it racing Get you to see me Got me afraid of you So far sometimes I forget to breathe Got me afraid that Whatever you are is where I have to be This is a fading from the album Ice Cream Every Day, that is Amel LaRue with the song titled Afraid, giving you another little way to bop into your weekend and especially into this TGIF edition of The Mojo. This is Stephanie Renee in studio with Mike D as we celebrate uh, all of the wonderful goodness that is part of the repertoire of our special guest today. Yeah, with us uh, for the hour, Rusty Kondiev, uh, right? And we want to go back, way back. <laughs> Before, before Fear of a Black Hat. Yes, indeed. To, you know, just to talk a little bit more about school days, Rusty, because, you know, both school days and uh, a different world 
came out my freshman year in college. So it really is sort of the chronicle for me of uh, how we talked about uh, the black college experience, how we talked about this idea of kind of rites of passage and how we are learning about one another and making decisions about moving into adulthood. And so, you know, to kind of talk about that in terms of this, uh, you know, uh, growing uh, career that you were having as an actor, as a writer, moving into being able to produce your own features. Well, uh, <laughs> school days and getting to work with Spike on that film was so incredibly instructive to me. Um, you know, previous to that, I had been done stand-up comedy. I started out as a stand-up comic. I kind of became an actor after that. And got lucky enough to be in another early, uh, early late Hollywood classic, I guess you could say, in Hollywood Shuffle. Yes. So I got to do that. And after Hollywood Shuffle, uh, the casting director to cast that, called a lot of us in to read for Spike's uh, movie. And, you know, She's Gotta Have It had just come out, so Spike was just, you know, the hottest thing uh, in terms of black film at the time. It had been a lo long time since we'd had somebody like that. I think Gordon Parks, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> the last big name. And so went in, uh, did a reading for the casting director, and... Uh, met Spike at the Chateau Marmont out here, a very famous Chateau Marmont, and he was so thrilled and enthusiastic about this movie he was going to do. I can remember going into his hotel room. He had seen, uh, seen my audition and said that I had a part in the movie, and you go in and you meet him, and he's like, ah, oh, they don't know what they've done, giving me the power. <laughs> 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 They're gonna be shocked. <laughs> I was like, "Oh, this is great!" <laughs> and uh, you know, the flight down to Atlanta where we shot—I uh, can remember getting on the plane, and, and a good majority of us that came from the Los Angeles area were on this flight. So, you know, you had Tisha Campbell and Jasmine Guy and Phil Cozart and just all these people that were mostly making up the 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 fellow. Well, not the fellows. Almost all came from New York, but. Mm -hmm. All of us, uh, all of us wannabes in G five G, flying it from plastic L A. <laughs> <laughs> and and Spike had all the all the real down people coming in from Brooklyn. So. <laughs> but uh, you know, we come in on this flight, and then we, we you know you you see all these black people on the flight, you know, young people like you, and you're like, oh man, it was just such a one. It was just a a wonderful time in terms of being an actor it was probably for most people one of the first big things that they had done. So, you know, if you can imagine being 20 some years old and getting, I forget how much our per diem was, but the money they give you for the week and people just went crazy, man. It was, uh, wow. it was, it was a blast. But watching Spike work, now he wasn't going crazy. He was working. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you saw how he approached uh, setting up his shots and the importance to him of this movie. I mean, you know, that's one of the things, you know, my takeaway from that, and, and something that I always felt anyhow, because uh, I grew up under a father who was very socially, you know, involved in issues. And I used to joke if, if, if a group had black, Negro, or colored in the title, or African American or something in the title, he was in the group. <laughs> <laughs> so I had, you know, that kind of idea of what of what film could do socially, but seeing Spike embrace it and use it, particularly for the the black issues, you know, that are, that are very narrow. When you start talking about good and bad hair and skin color and how we deal with ourselves, it was a very uh, it was a movie that really dealt with internal issues within the black community. It, w it wasn't about as much about the outside world. You know, yeah. Even with the Sam Jackson character, when he comes into the shop, and, and they're kind of different him. And it's mm -hmm. the, the intellectual blacks at the school versus uh, you know, the kind of working class blacks that haven't had the opportunity to you know, get the same education. Yeah. So he had all these issues kind of rolled up into this movie. And I can remember at different points people kind of questioning him, you know, from the cast, saying, 
well, you know, should this end this way or should it be that way? And I remember Spike saying, if you don't like it, make your own damn film. <laughs> <laughs> I love Leave it. Leave me alone. <laughs> right, right. He's like, this is the story I'm trying to tell. Yeah. No, that was... Yeah, just, and, and it was, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't remember being a critic, but I remember hearing those words. And I said, yeah, he's right. And so... I think right after that film, I started writing, uh, or maybe it was even during, I started writing a film called uh, The Other Class at the time, which was about a, a group of young black professionals that never got made, but the film got me my first screenwriting credit, nice. which was for House Party 2. Ah. So I, yeah, I had sent out my script, and uh, a lot of people had read it, and at the time, there was a... I think the only black writers in Hollywood that were probably around my age were Spike and Robert and me and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, the Hudlins, Reggie. Mm -hmm. And um, so when Reggie just, and, and his brother decided uh, they weren't going to do uh, House Party 2 for whatever reason, I was fortunate enough to get that job. So that, that between uh, school days and watching Spike on school days, getting the drive to want to write a script myself, uh, from watching him and, and want to make movies from watching him because up to that point I was just a, saw myself only as a performer. Uh, I was able to jump over, get a real job, get a very nice paycheck. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a that's a nice callback too because you have uh, Jackson and McHenry in Fear of a Black Hat. Yeah, they make a yeah, cameo. George and Doug, and uh, I, I don't know if you've ever had the pleasure to meet. Uh, sadly, George has passed away. Yeah, Doug's still with us. But, man, these two guys had the hugest personalities of any executive that I met. I mean, when you would go and have a meeting with them, it was like watching a show. Mm -hmm. It was hilarious. Wow. And uh, really great salesmen in that kind of old-school salesman fashion. Um, and so when I did Fear of a Black Hat, I called George and Doug. I said, you guys have to play a manager in this. They're like, we don't act. I'm like, you don't have to act. Just be yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but but well, speaking of fear of a black I was going to say we have a we have, oh, we a, have a clip a that we want to play yeah. for you uh you know just just to lead just into to lead that part of the conversation. Of um Okay. If this rings a bell. <laughs> yeah. Red this is Ice Froggy Frog, and this is a little song for all the polywalks and the tadpoles from the big frog. the depths of the pond, back to the top, ice froggy frog jumping and I got the drop, it's solo in that grass, tadpoles will sing, long reach to the spot where my tongue will fling, hipping and hopping, hopping and hipping, but don't lose your sleep, nine four zay is easier for me to look up the shoes. Uh, love it! <laughs> <laughs> And, and while, while we're giving while we're giving personal anecdotes, I have to let you know that Fear of a Black Hat, of course, played in art house theaters here in the Philadelphia area. And so my roommate and I at the time went to go see it. And it was a it was a pretty packed theater. But we were just about the only little butterscotch chips in the in the mix uh, in the audience. And when I say belly laugh. We were belly laugh, and, and and there were so many white folks. God bless them, who were who were there, who were laughing. But they were almost tentative. Like, should I think? Should I laugh this hard at this yeah. joke? Because they, you know, culturally, they didn't know exactly where they fit into the mix. But she and I lit up the theater with laughter at this film. Love it so much. Oh, that that's great to hear. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was weird. Fear, you know, I the audience for that was so much broader than I expected, and I think part of that is, or was particularly at the time, the, the, the belief in Hollywood amongst, you know, most of the, the white Hollywood establishment that black films did not carry over to white audiences. Right. And uh, obviously today you're seeing more and more that, that that is not true, but even at that period, uh, I think maybe because it was a music-oriented film about hip-hop, which had already found a lot of white fans, it, it fit in so many places. I've been to Germany and Italy. We won an award for that movie in, uh, in Sweden. Hmm. And I'm like, really? 
<laughs> it's, a, it's a film. I mean, you know, so much of the humor in the film is based on language. Yeah. yeah. That I, I was surprised that it it translated over to you know these other these other cultures with different languages where English wasn't the first language. So uh, it's, it's cool to hear you know that story. I, I, I had a similar experience when we first showed showed the film at Sundance. And uh, which was pretty much an all white audience, and, mm. and they loved the film, and I was really shocked. Uh, but it, 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 it worked out well. Yeah. No, that, that, I mean, it sets a template for what you would do later with Chappelle, but I mean, how, how does it, you, you started out, you wrote a sort of a Buppy comedy, and then it, you just straight out farcical spoof. I mean, what, what's, how did this yeah, come about? I be? mean, the, yeah, the, the Buppy comedy was the, uh, uh, the other class. That, right. That, uh, but yeah, the, the I, I was a Spinal Tap fan, and I don't know if okay. you guys have ever. Yep. Spinal Tap. Rob but, Reiner, yeah. Yeah, just that is a brilliant satire. Uh, and I was a hip hop fan. Uh, you know, I, I was a rap fan, and rap at the time seemed very ripe for some type of satirical look at it. But at the same time, I got to play around with. It, um, social issues, even within the satire. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, you yeah. know, because, especially back at that point in hip-hop, there were so many conscious rappers. You know, I could I could have a conscious rapper in there. I could have, you know, more of the gangster rapper in there. We had the, you know, love and peace and psychedelic rapper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we had all of these things that we could play around with. And... Uh, you know, just had a lot of fun. Yeah, you, that, you were that ice was, cold. It, it's kind of probably of the movies that I've done, the most fun I've ever had on a set. Which is, it was great. Oh, I'd love. I, I'm sure there's outtakes. I'd love to see even more than what's on the DVD. Now, we're, this weekend is the 30th anniversary of the LA riots, right? So, yeah. so I mean, I'm, uh, and you it definitely make mention of it quite a few times in Fear of a Black uh, Hat. W uh, were you in LA at the time that that was happening? And not 30th, yes, 25. Actually, 25, we were 92, around, 25, I'm sorry. Yeah, we, well, we were um, casting for Fear of a Black Hat the day that uh, the day that the riot began. Wow. <laughs> so the riot through line came in um, because the riots happened right before we got the project off the ground. Mm. Um. You know, the whole thing with Reginald Denny and the, 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 the crazy stuff that happened uh, down in South Central that day. We, I, I literally was casting some of the characters that ended up in the movie and driving home and hearing this on the radio and then going home and seeing all this footage. And, you know, L.A. kind of shut down wow. uh, for a couple of days. Yeah. The interesting thing about the riot uh, that doesn't get talked about um, and, and doesn't get remembered that much uh, because it wasn't even made aware to people then, was that it wasn't, there were things happening outside of the black community. The, the, the mania of that time carried over into white areas. Hmm. And there were white people breaking into stores and stealing stuff, too. Wow. Yeah. Um, USC is down in that, uh, in you know, in the South Central area. And I remember seeing and hearing reports about 32nd Street Market, uh, which is a little market in that area, shop, shopping shopping uh, center. There were white students from USC going in there uh, and doing things. And then yeah. uh, an area that I lived in, there were Best Buys being broken into. And unless they were uh, putting black people on buses and sending them into the area, <laughs> <laughs> they weren't the people in there. <laughs> right, right. It, so, you know, it, when... Things go crazy. It, everything goes crazy, and and it wasn't just black people who were who were uh, to use a, an expression wilding out. Right. 
Right. Well, we've got to take our final commercial break of today's segment, but we want you to hang tight because we've got plenty of questions to ask about Chappelle okay. and, 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 you know, just, yeah, the overall conversation around, you know, the longevity in the industry and maintaining it because a lot of people are trying to figure that out. So we are going to take a, our final commercial break, ladies and gentlemen, and come back and conclude our conversation with our special guest, Rusty Kundiev, on this week's edition of Real Black Radio. Hang tight. Place Like Home 2, located 2276 George's Lane, provides a clean and active environment for people who have dementia, Alzheimer's, and physical disabilities. A Place Like Home 2 offers older adults a wide variety of services in a protective group setting, including referrals, daily cognitive therapy, podiatry, exercise, and so much more. Free transportation is possible. If you're looking for a Place Like Home for your loved one, call 215-878-1200. I'm Ramona Africa, the MOVE organization. Join me and my MOVE family at the Auden Reed High School at 33rd and Tasker Street, May 5th, 6th, and 7th. Hear everything you ever wanted to know about MOVE. Vendors welcome. For more info, call 215-386-1165. On a MOVE. They'll challenge your authority because that's what kids do. But this car is your territory. And in here, your word is law. So when you say you won't move until everyone's buckled up, you won't budge an inch until you hear that click. Never give up until they buckle up. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. For more information, visit safercar.gov slash kids buckle up. Join me, Solomon Jones, morning host on 900 AM WURD for If These Walls Could Talk, Solving Reentry and Recidivism. All takes place Monday, May 8th from 530 to 730 at the African American Museum at 701 Arch Street. We'll bring together voices from both sides of the prison system. Leon King, former Philadelphia Prisons Commissioner. Ruben Jones, co-founder of Frontline Dads. Valerie Todd Lisman of Mothers in Charge. And Emily Restrepo, a freelance journalist. It's all moderated by me. Go to 900 AM WURD.com to register for this free event. It's all brought to you by WURD, The Reentry Project, Philadelphia Media Networks, and WHYY. Step into spring with the four-word movement and qualify for your chance to win nights out on the town. Sign up or renew your four-word membership before May 4th, and you may win a culturally rich music experience. With a ticket pack that includes tickets to see American singer, songwriter, bassist, and vocalist Michelle and Deggio Cello at the Annenberg Center. The soulful musical smash hit Motown the Musical Live coming to the Academy of Music and soulful singer, songwriter, and musician John Legend at the BB&T Pavilion. Sign up or renew your four-word membership today and experience your nights on the town. I'm glad to be a member, and now I am extra glad to be a member. Visit 900amwurd.com or call 215-425-7875. Support independent black media. This is Hannibal Lukumbe. You're listening to The Mojo with Stephanie Renee on 900am WURD.
from their debut EP that was the group formerly known as Tangible Truth shout out to uh, to uh, oh my lord shout out to Tangible Truth no uh, uh, oh, her name is going to come back to me now See, the, the, cause the former so, lead singer because I got too much going on in my she, brain this she, morning she loves Rusty so much she's just holding <sighs> Back a but bit. the song was titled Saturday, but just to give you a little taste of Philadelphia based rock, because, you know, okay. we talk about all these things about how we expand our cultural horizons. And, you know, the the great part about that is how this leads back into our conversation with Rusty mm -hmm. is that he was just telling us about thinking of himself as a performer doing stand up before getting these opportunities to act in these films. And, you know, the great part about now where we'd like to take the conversation is in going back to those comedic, those, you know, deeply comedic comedy. roots and yeah. helping to write some well, of our favorite uh, segments of the Chappelle show. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, for those who don't know, um, like the, the other than Rick James sketch, the landmark sketch for me on Chappelle show is the black white supremacist sketch. Yes. From the very first episode of Chappelle show. <laughs> yes. And, it it would not have been the same if not for this gentleman on the line. That's right. So t tell us a little bit about, you know, conceptualizing some of our favorite, because I did also appreciate the Nagars. Yes. Uh, and, you know, as one of the other ones that you that you wrote. Or, or well, uh, you know, I got very fortunate to get involved in, uh, with Chappelle Show. Dave was a fan of Fear of a Black Hat and Tales from the Hood. And, in fact, uh, really loved Tales from the Hood. Cast Clarence Williams III in one of his films, uh, Half Baked, because mm -hmm. of Tales. Mm -hmm. So, um, when I got the call from Dave uh, to come back and work on Chappelle show, and he sent me some of the sketches that they were they were considering doing, and he's like, "Do you like these?" And I was like, "Man, these are amazing!" and the blind supremacist sketch was one of the first sketches that uh, he had in this packet that he wanted to do, that he had written. And my job was to, you know, visualize this thing from a director's standpoint and, and, and play it out. Not throwing some jokes and stuff here and there, but I, I can't take anything away from the genius of Dave for creating this, this really brilliant uh, character that he had of this black guy who was blind and thought he was white and was a angry white <laughs> racist guy. And so, uh, you know, I, I did my homework on the sketch. We were obviously doing the takeoff of the whole front line style of, uh, documentary. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when we got out there, it, it was, it was really magical. It was like, sometimes you do something and you, you just see it happen in front of you as you're working on it. And I knew it was, I knew it was a great sketch. I, I, and I knew that the message that it had was going to be powerful. And I think so did Dave. Uh, you know, Comedy Central, uh, the show had not yet been on, and we did this sketch. And they liked the sketch, but they were afraid of it. They said, mm -hmm. no, man, you got to put that and the third or fourth episode because you're going to scare people. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not how it's done. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's like, shock them. Exactly. And <laughs> Dave threatened to quit his show. That had never been on the air. Mm. Um, he said, I will stop doing the show if it's not in the first episode. And the, you know, the, the, <laughs> I, I, the only way I can say the cojones, I won't say it, the English one, <laughs> the to do that is uh, pretty incredible because yeah. there's not a lot of people that would walk away from money they haven't even gotten when the money was going to be big and long and it was going to accelerate your fame, etc., etc. There's just not a lot of people that have that kind of disposition, but Dave did. And fortunately, it ended up in the first episode, as you say, and uh, it really made that show. It, it, it showed immediately where that 
show is coming from from an attitude standpoint. Well, you so know, just, I, I was just going to say, just in terms of Black history, though, I, I think that you know Dave was very influenced by Richard Pryor, and, and if you think about the Richard Pryor show and all that he went through in order to be able to do sketches and tell stories the way he wanted to do, there's some precedent for it, and I think that's one of the reasons why those of us who study these kinds of things are that much more endeared to the work that you've done and that he's done in that regard in order to bring this stuff to life because we know how much of a struggle it is to maintain an authentic voice in the midst of even trying to make us laugh. Yeah, it, it's true. Uh, I, I mean, it's tough to maintain an authentic voice in, in Hollywood in general. You know, I, I flash back to um, the things that, that went on culturally you know, earlier in, in our history, like during the Harlem Renaissance. And it was the same thing. You had these really great writers, Langston Hughes and uh, uh, Zora uh, Hurston, and, mm-hmm. and all these really good painters and sculptors. And the stories that came out of that were helped along by patrons. Now, generally speaking, all of the patrons, or most of them, were white. They were paying for the art that these people yes. were producing. And because they were paying for it, they had great influence over which stories, which art, which paintings got to be seen. Yep. And some of the some of the writers back then co- would complain that certain stories like this wouldn't be told because it was these people who were paying for the art that wanted to see very particular images of the black experience. Right. And so, flash forward to today, the issue is still telling varied stories of the black experience, um, you know, and it costs money to do these, these films, and, and uh, then now, because of technology, you can do stuff on a small scale for a small budget. And I think that's why you're seeing a wider variety of stories being told. And I think you're seeing uh, stories about the black experience coming out that speak in a, in a more particular way to our to our history and who we are and, and, and hopefully show us, you know, show us these stories in a way that is the least, least amount uh, influenced by outsiders who have particular ways that they want to view our community. Without question. It's interesting you bring that up because uh, I was at an event with uh, Nelson George and he was talking about the, the time period, the, the, um, the mid nineties when, when you were making features in Hollywood and he was saying a lot of the benefactors then were just these smaller studios like the Savoy pictures or the Trimarks <coughs> or whatever. And, you know, but, and they were looking to make fast money and that created an opportunity for black filmmakers, but then the, they got absorbed by other companies or they went out of business. I think that's why a lot of your work was harder to find for a while because you were wor- working with the smaller labels. But I mean, bring, bring it back to sprung. Black Love, that's a story that still, to this day, no matter all the stuff that's coming on, watching Dear White People this morning, there's no Black Love yet. I'm, I'm two episodes in, I'm still waiting for the Black Love. So tell us about how, how did you get sprung through the system? That's what I want to know. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> Sprung, uh, that was a Trimark movie. Uh, and I remember when we met with them, what they really wanted was a black dumb, dumb and dumber. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Okay, uh, that, that's not what I'm trying to do right now. So uh, somehow or another, we we pitched this idea of this romantic romantic comedy, and uh, I guess we got we got lucky. You know, they're like, well, you know, we've got black people in it. Black things are selling. Let's go for it. Out <laughs> 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 of the attitude. Um, but, you know, I, I got, got lucky with uh, Paula J. Parker back because I had worked with her on Tales from the Hood and, mm-hmm. and Joe Torrey, who I'd worked with on Tales from the Hood. Yep. Yes. Tisha, who I had been fortunate enough to meet and work with in school days. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, a movie that, I, you know, I look back on it now, there's, there's things that I would probably change because I'm older and, Hopefully wiser. <laughs> I have three kids now, and I'm like, well, y'all can't watch this movie. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so true to that time period. 
It really was. I mean, you know, when I when you look back at film, anyhow, and uh, I realize Stephanie, you're I, I'm, I don't know how old you are, Stephanie. I know is younger than me. Mm-hmm. But when you look, back, I look back at on movies that I watched when I was uh, thirteen, fourteen, like The Goonies, for example. Mm-hmm. Was I played it for my kids, and I was like, oh my god, they're cursing at the store. <laughs> 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 and, and that was a PG movie back then. Yeah. Right? PG-13. PG. Yeah. And these kids were talking like sailors, man. So, you know, uh, over time things PG. change. And, yes, yeah, Sprung definitely, you know, there's a, there's a bit of a time capsule quality to it. But the story itself, the, the love story is, you know, universal and timeless when you're dealing with, you know, what, what it is two sets of friends, yeah. and then the love relationships between the friends, yeah. and, you know, how when your best friend that you're used to hanging out with all the time suddenly gets a boyfriend or a girlfriend or whatever it is, and all of a sudden they're not there to watch the game with you, or they're not there to go out to the party with you, they're going with this person, and you feel sidelined. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, that's, that's honest across cultures, but then within Sprung, you know, I tried to put in some of the the music. There's the the dance scene with Tisha and myself. Yes, yeah. Tisha's really good. I'm kind of clumsy, but you know, we have the, the older the music, and we see all these older people out there dancing. And I mm-hmm. wanted to bring some of that in because uh, you know, love doesn't end with you know someone who's thirty or forty. It it, it goes on. You know, there's the older you get, it's just a deeper way or a different way that you experience it. But mm-hmm. it's important to know that that translates through the ages. And I think so many times when you look at uh, film, the love stories are always, they keep them, you know, they're either high school or 20-something. Maybe yeah, something usually 29 after, and right? the fear of turning 30. Yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, and, and after that, you, you, you ain't sexing it up no more. <laughs> Well, I got to tell you that Sprung was one of those films that I owned on VHS and would watch it continually. If I didn't watch it like every weekend, I at least watched it once a month. And that's back when you have to rewind the tape all the way back. So I I have been a fan for a long time. So when I when I'm gushing, understand that it's very genuine. And I'm so thankful that you were able to give us this time today to talk about your amazing catalog of work. And, you know, we're going to keep our eyes open for all the different ways that you'll continue to interact with the industry. Yeah, so Rusty. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. So Rusty, yeah, what what are you working on now? Right. And if there was a sequel to Fear of a Black Hat, what would Ice Cube, uh, Ice Cold, be doing <laughs> today? You know, we've talked about doing a sequel, and uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure, but we talked about doing a sequel where the guys decide to go out on a reunion tour. And they're expecting it to be the same as it was. When they were <laughs> and, you know, they're like, it's going to be all, all the fine women are going to be out. But it's all the women that were out. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a bunch of old women just like them. <laughs> you know, so, so maybe we'll get around to doing that. It does look like we may be doing another Tales uh, We've been talking to Spike and Universal, and it looks Yay! like it might happen. I got my fingers crossed on that. Oh, that'd be well, awesome. You know, def- definitely, definitely it's time. And for those who've been waiting, Tales from the Hood on Blu-ray, courtesy of Shout Factory, awesome job. Looks beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I, 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 I hope uh, your entire catalog gets the same treatment yes. because this, this is an unsung hero, pioneer super talented thank you so much and i was gonna say and if you make your way east anywhere near philadelphia you must come in and hang with us in studio oh that would be great so uh, tell someone that, oh i have i have my email so i got somebody's yeah. email yeah i will do that excellent perfect thank you thank you so much so uh that was that was awesome um real quick um, rest in peace, Jonathan Demi. Yeah, one, one, one of my mentors. And and that episode of Shots Fired that he directed that you know just you know, I don't believe in coincidences. Mm-hmm. I believe that was divine providence the same day, that yeah. aired the same day that he made transition. It was powerful. Wow. And um, slight is in theaters today, everywhere. Mm-hmm. 
uh, Henrietta Lacks on HBO if you haven't seen it. Dear White People yes. on Netflix. Netflix. All 10 episodes dropped, so you got something to do. Well, you should play in the sunshine, but um, good good, good show. If you, if you are frustrated by the feature, this actually takes off from the moment the feature ends and, and ties up storylines and all kinds of stuff. Really good. Shout out to Justin Simeon. The two documentaries about the L.A. riots, again, 25th anniversary, as yes. you said, uh, this weekend, one on National Geographic and, and one, I forget where the other channels. And then I'm on the Michaud Mission. Shout out to those guys Ooh. doing a podcast with Trina Parks, Darktown Strutters. And I Am Not Your Negro. Yes. Oh, I got it in my pocket. Comes out <laughs> on Blu-ray yeah. and uh, DVD on Tuesday. I know it's backwards to those of you who are looking at uh, Facebook Live, but just you know, yeah. trust us Os- on this one. Oscar nominated and uh, Real Black, if you check out the website on Tuesday, we'll be giving away three downloads uh, to it so that's that's i know we were over our time but yes we are but you know we just want to thank everybody that's been checking us out on facebook live we always appreciate you thank you for bringing rusty on to chat with us and now you are obligated to follow up with him and make sure that when he's in town that we get a chance to play live oh oh okay for for us and for the folks that's your bucket list moment well he's from pittsburgh so i'm sure he's in he's in the area quite a bit i think so anyway um yeah thank you this is great indeed so we got to take a quick break ladies and gentlemen another programming note for those of you who did not hear earlier in the program we were supposed to be throwing this to uh um independence blue cross live for our cooking demonstration but that is going to be recorded and available on our website so we'll be continuing with hour three of the mojo after this break Hang tight and bye to those of you on Facebook Live. Every two seconds, someone's identity.